are absolutely delighted to be back here. You know, my my speaking schedule was completely filled, and um, but my office manager knew that we enjoyed the time when we came to Ufala. So he said, well, there's this thing, Ufala, and it could probably be squeezed between this and this. Um, and I asked Candy, I said, want to go back to Ufala? And she said, Ufala, yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so there is something very special about this place, and so thank you for your kind invitation. And I'm delighted to be here with, uh, with some of the candidates who uh, promised to bring some integrity back to the government. That's what we're doing. But I hope, uh, I hope people sometimes stop and think about what an incredible privilege it is to be born in the USA. We're very lucky in this country. And you know what? This is an amazing place and an incredibly strong nation. The very fact that we're still standing after many years of no leadership tells you that it is an incredibly strong country. However, it can be even stronger with good leadership. And that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about tonight. Now, you know, it's interesting that, you know, when I retired last year, I was really looking forward to it. Because I, mean, I had a very, very arduous uh, career in neurosurgery, nearly 15,000 operations, many of them extraordinarily complex. Uh, year after year, 16-hour days, and I was just thinking, wow, never have to set the alarm clock. <laughs> you can watch all those movies that everybody else has seen and you've never seen before, and play golf, and play the organ. I wanted to learn how to play the organ. We even bought an organ. It's a really nice organ. <laughs> I think I turned it on four times. But, uh, but you know, sometimes the good Lord has plans for us that we don't anticipate. And he knows really what's best, and he actually prepares you for the things that he wants you to do. And uh, throughout my entire medical career, which was pretty amazing, in fact, if somebody had sat me down in front of a computer and said, I want you to type out the career that you want to have, and that's what will happen. I could not have come up with a better scenario. And that tells me that there was someone greater than me who was involved in planning it. And I'm finding exactly the same thing happening since I retired in terms of the doors that are opening, the connections that are being made. All, everything is just falling in place. I feel almost like a bystander. You know, when we wrote the last book, uh, one Nation, uh, which as you just heard is number one on the New York Times bestseller list, as was the previous book, America the Beautiful, both of which were the only two books that I wrote with my wife, Candy. <laughs> so that tells you something. But uh, the other ones were written with professional co-writers. And uh, we actually just finished uh, the manuscript for an e-book called One Boat. Uh, which hopefully will have very wide distribution. It's not a partisan book in any way, but it helps Americans to recognize the incredible privilege and the responsibility that one has as a voter. You know, in the last presidential election, 93 million people did not vote. That's more than either candidate got. So, those people are going to have to somehow be brought back into the fold. I've met a lot of them, many of them being elderly, who said that they had pretty much given up on the idea of America and they were just waiting to die. We're going to have to reactivate those people in a big way and uh, get them thinking not so much about their own future, but about the future of their children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren. Uh, and we want to leave, obviously, something for, for them that we can be extremely proud of. Now, as you 
well remember from the last time I was here, uh, I'm not politically correct. And I don't like political correctness. So it is possible that someone might be offended by something I say. Uh, it will not be intentional. But, um, you know, the whole concept of political correctness just irritates me because so many people came here because they were trying to escape from people who told them what they could and couldn't say, could and couldn't do, what they had to buy, where they could live, all this kind of stuff. It, this was supposed to be a land of free people who could pursue things the way they want. But the PC police have become so strong that they've managed to beat people into submission. So the majority of Americans who actually think logically are afraid to express themselves because they will be attacked. They will be called some kind of name. I mean, if you're pro-life, then you're automatically anti-woman in the PC world. And you know, if you're pro-traditional marriage, then you're automatically anti-gay and a homophobe. And you know, if you're a white person and you say something against a progressive black person, you're a racist. And if you're a black person and you say something against a progressive black person, you're crazy. So, <laughs> you know, it's just it's it's just so so absurd what we've allowed to happen and how we allow it to control us. And it's really all about intimidation. Because really that's the only power that the PC police have. They intimidate you. They frighten you. And they make you afraid to speak up. It's sort of like I remember when I was eight years old. As a kid, I was deathly afraid of dogs. I mean, I would be late going to school because there would be a dog down the street. I had to go all the way around the block. And if there was a dog there, I had to go around the next block. And it just kept going. And, uh, and then a, a man told me, he said, dogs only bother people who are afraid of them. And if you ignore the dog, they won't bother you. I said, are you sure about this? Because so, uh, there was this dog down the street named Rusty, and he was kind of a mean dog. He would, people just would avoid that area because this dog was so mean. So I figured I would test this theory out. So I went walking down toward where Rusty was. He couldn't believe it. You know, I started licking his chops. And uh, came running up toward me, barking and snarling. And, and I just kept walking, although I was pretty sure this was a mistake at this point. <laughs> but uh, he ran right up to my leg, and he just turned around and walked back to the porch. The next time I walked down there, he just barked and snarled from the porch, but he didn't come down. And the next time, he just laid there and looked at me. And he, he came to realize that I wasn't afraid of him, so he didn't bother me. And that's exactly what the left-wing PC uh, progressives do. And what we have to do, doesn't matter whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or independent, whatever you are, you seem to learn to ignore it, not let it bother you. And remember, in Rules for Radicals, you know, Saul Alinsky says, Never have a conversation with your adversary because that humanizes them. And your job is to demonize them. And that's what you see, demonizing, calling names, never really actually talking about the subject matter at hand. And that's a guaranteed formula for failure. And we just have to be smart enough to recognize that that's what's going on and to do something about it. Well, interestingly enough, you know, I had this great dream of becoming a physician early on. And even though I wasn't a particularly good student, you know how kids are, you just latch onto something and you think somehow it's going to happen. So I believed that I was going to be a physician anyway. 
even after my parents got divorced. And uh, that was a devastating situation. Some of you probably have been through it. And there we were living in poverty, my mother with only a third grade education, working so hard, getting up at five in the morning, leaving the house, getting back after midnight, day after day after day. Frequently, we didn't see her until the weekend because she would be gone before we left and we would be in bed when she came back home. And she would leave instructions for us. But um, we were pretty much latchkey kids. And it was really the grace of God that protected us because there was a lot of bad stuff going on. And uh, you know, there were times when you know, we certainly could have gotten into a lot of trouble. And I certainly did see a lot of people get in trouble. Uh, saw people severely injured, saw people killed, but it never happened to us. And I think there was always that, that guardian that was uh, looking over our shoulders to make sure that nothing happened. But I do remember very specifically that I hated poverty. You know, some people hate snakes and spiders. I hated poverty. I just couldn't stand it. And I was sure that there was a mistake and that I had been born into the wrong family. But uh, <laughs> there was I had to, to deal with it. And, but you know, my mother made the, the best of every situation. She could stretch a dollar further than anybody. In fact, I'm certain that if my mother were the Secretary of Treasury, we would not be in a deficit situation <laughs> right now. But you know, her, her dream was to be independent because after the divorce, we had to go live with her sister and brother-in-law. But after a couple of years of working and saving, you know, she was independent. And, you know, I was a terrible student. And I must admit that I did admire the smart kids. I wouldn't have to ever tell them that I admired them, but I, I said, wow, how can they know so much stuff to the same age as I am? And there was this one kid in particular, his name was Steve. He was the smartest kid in the class. And he always made sure you knew that. And he would come up to you after a test, and you'd hold his test in your face. And he'd say, look what I got, look. Let me see yours. And you wanted to let him see it all right, but you couldn't. <laughs> and, uh, but it, secretly, I admired Steve, and I just couldn't imagine how he knew so much stuff. But my mother was just so alarmed with the fact that I was doing so poorly at school. And she prayed, and she asked God, what can she do to get her sons to achieve? Because she knew how limited her opportunities had been because of the limited education. And yet there we seemed to be falling into the same trap. And you know, the nice thing about God is you don't have to have a PhD to talk to him. You just have to have faith. And she believed that he would give her the wisdom. And he did, in her opinion. You know, my brother and I didn't think it was wise at all. <laughs> Turning off the TV, what kind of wisdom is that? And making us read two books a piece from the Detroit Public Library every week and submit to her written book reports, which she couldn't read, but we didn't know that. <laughs> and she would put check marks and highlights and underlines, and we would think she was reading them, but she wasn't. But you know, the interesting thing is, as I started reading those books, I started learning stuff. I started learning a lot of stuff about all kinds of things. And pretty soon when the teacher would ask questions and only Steve or some of the other smart kids knew the answer, I knew the answer too. And that made me excited. And then I started reading on my own. My mother didn't have to make me read. I was constantly reading. If I had five minutes, I had a book. My mother would say, Benjamin, put the book down and eat your food. It didn't matter. I was always reading. And within the space of a year and a half, I went from the bottom of the class to the top of the class. And I remember going up to Steve. <laughs> and I said, uh, hey, Steve, how'd you do on the exam? He said, 
Oh, I got a 91. And I said, I got a 100. <laughs> and I said, next time if you need help, let me know. But, uh, I was perhaps a little obnoxious, but uh, it sure felt good to say that to that turkey. But, uh, but you know, it's, it, it just goes to show what a difference it can make when you inform yourself. And in that case, with reading. And that's what our, our founders thought. They said that our system of government and our freedom is based upon a well-informed and educated populace. And if they ever become anything other than that, our nation will rapidly change. And what did they mean by that? They meant that people would not have the wherewithal to understand what they were being told. And it would be very easy for slick and dishonest politicians and news media to lead them wherever they wanted to go. That's why it is so critical that we re-educate ourselves as a nation. We are no longer a well-educated nation. You look at all the international educational surveys, you know, we're, we're nowhere near where we used to be. We used to be right at the top. And now we're hovering around the bottom. All you have to do is go out on the street and start talking to people about simple stuff. They don't know. They don't know what the Bill of Rights is. You know, they, they just don't know anything. You look at those jaywalking segments, or uh, Jesse Waters' world. <laughs> I mean, it is, it's really quite astonishing. I remember Waters was on a, in an area where there were a bunch of young people at college camps or something. He's asking about Benghazi. And they thought, yeah, that's a singer, right? Bad yeah. guys. You know? I mean, this, this is, this is how, how bad it's gotten. And the worst thing is, these people vote, and, and they have no knowledge. And basically, they just wait for somebody to tell them what they're supposed to do. And this is our nation. So I'll have a, a bit more to say about that momentarily. But when you stop and you think about the incredible potential that exists in a normal human being with these incredible brains that remember everything you've ever seen, everything you've ever heard, can process more than two million bits of information per second, cannot be overloaded. Don't ever listen to anybody tell you you can overload your brain. You can't do it. If you learn one new fact every second, it would take you more than three million years to overload your brain. So it is a phenomenal working system. And what we as a nation have to recognize is that we have 320 million people with fabulous brains. And we've got to cultivate every single one of those brains. We need them all because we're competing with India, which has over a billion people, China, who has over a billion people. So even if they only cultivate a third of their people, they can compete with us quite easily. So that's why we've got to begin to emphasize education more widely. And we've got to start thinking about situations like the one that occurred in Ferguson, Missouri, a few weeks ago. And, you know, as I said, you know, both in printed press and in the electronic media, it's not a racial issue. It's a social issue. Because you take millions of young men, and I don't care what their nationality is, you raise them in an environment 
where there's a lack of father figures to teach them how to relate to authority. And an environment where people learn that the solution to conflict is violence. In an environment where there's no teaching of self-respect or independence or self-reliance. An environment where there's easy access to drugs and alcohol. And what do you think is going to happen to that young man? Eventually, and again, it doesn't matter what his nationality is, he's raised that way, eventually he's going to run afoul of the law. Or of another individual like himself. And the baddest one wins. So what do you wind up with? Incredible carnage and death. In our inner cities, the most common cause of death for young black men is homicide. That's a disaster. Can we really afford to be throwing away those individuals? So we need to be starting to think about what true compassion is. Mohammed Yunus, who won the Nobel Prize in 2006 for his theory on micro-lending and microeconomics, which lifted millions of people out of poverty in Bangladesh in India and Pakistan. Same kinds of things can be done in this country because we have to be thinking about ways to empower people so that they can become independent. And in the long run, that makes us all more independent because we don't have large groups of people depending on what you do. They depend on what they do. That's what made America into a great nation. The can-do attitude, the self-reliance that allowed people to strike out on their own. They were willing to, to go out into untested lands, dangerous places, and they relied upon themselves and their neighbors, and they worked together. And communities developed, sometimes hundreds of miles away from other communities. But by taking advantage of everybody's gifts and talents, they were able to create successful towns. And if something happened, somebody fell off of a cliff or injured their leg or injured by an animal, everybody helped them. You know, that's what we have got to develop once again, the sense of community because one of the reasons that churches have tax exemptions in our country is because they're right there amongst the people. And it's our opportunity to help the people in our communities. You know, Kenny and I went to a church-based philanthropic organization in Tennessee. And uh, it was very impressive. These people, people of privilege, would go out on the streets of Memphis and find people who were downtrodden, the dregs of society, bring them into their program, where they gave them a 13-week free course, how to present themselves, clean them up, dress them up, how to get a job, help them to get jobs, talk to their employers, to help make sure that they could keep those jobs. After three months, 70% of those people were off of public welfare. One young lady I was particularly impressed with, she had been homeless and a drug addict. And she was only three months away from getting her PhD. I mean, these are, these are the kinds of talents that we're wasting in our society. And part of the problem, and one of the reasons that we have so many people in this dependent situation is because people in our society who thought they were doing good, maybe, were really not doing good. They're patting people on the head and saying, there, there, you poor little thing. 
I'm going to take care of you because those mean people do this to you. So I'm going to give you your food subsidies and your housing subsidies and your medical subsidies and everything you need. And you just sit back and relax. And all you have to do is vote for me. And this has created a culture of dependency. It is absolutely the cruelest thing that you can do to anybody. It's exactly the same thing that happened years ago with Native Americans, who were once very proud people. And then when the federal government started saying, well, we gotta do this, and we we'll give them this, and give them that, and what happened? And now you go onto some of the reservations, and all you see is drunkenness. I remember uh, a few years ago, I, I was uh, asked to come to Foxwood, which is the largest of the casinos in the United States, in Connecticut. Uh, and the tribe there was interested in me speaking at an all-tribe graduation. Anybody who was graduating from anything, they were having this big celebration. But some of the elders of the tribe told me that the, the reason they were so anxious for me to come is because they make a lot of money at Foxwood. And the young people were not motivated to go to college. When they got 16, they just wanted their new BMW so they could drive around and go on cruises and do all kinds of things, but not developing themselves intellectually because they had all that money. So you see, it's, it's not even necessarily a matter of poverty. It's a matter of motivation. And this is what we have to bring back to America, the can-do attitude versus the what can you do for me attitude. It makes all the difference in the world. One of the things that I encourage people to do, because present company included, we can all use more knowledge, is to promise yourself that for the next year you will spend one half hour a day reading something new about something you don't know anything about. It can be finance, geography, history, algebra, physics, you know, uh, and, uh, any variety of things. Spend a year, half an hour a day. I guarantee you, in a year's time, people who haven't seen you for a while will look at you and they'll say, who are you? Where did you come from? They will not recognize you. You will be so smart. And you won't even recognize yourself. It's uh, amazing what can happen. But what an informed individual you will be at that time. And you can have uh, a tremendous influence on people around you. And what a tremendous example it provides for the young people in your life. And it's not at all a large investment. And it makes a tremendous difference. Well, you would have thought that you know, once I got myself together academically, life is going to be pretty, pretty good. Wrong. You see, unfortunately, I ran into a, another problem. I had a terrible temper. I was one of those people who thought they had a lot of rights. You know anybody like that? I mean, the more rights you think you have, the more likely someone is to infringe upon them. So people were always infringing on my rights. I remember a fellow hit me with a pebble, it didn't hurt, but I was incensed that he would dare hit me with a pebble. And I threw a large rock at his face, broke his glasses, almost put his eye out. Another time a fellow was trying to close my locker, I didn't want it closed. I hit him in the forehead with my fist, unfortunately still had the lock in my hand. Put a three inch gash in his forehead. My mother wanted me to wear something I didn't want to wear. I picked up a hammer. I went to hit her in the head with it. Fortunately, my brother caught it from behind. Other than that, I was a pretty good kid. But you can see, <laughs> <laughs> you can see how that temper can really get the best of you. And um, you know, when I was 14, 
another teenager angered me and I had a large camping knife and tried to stab him in the abdomen and fortunately he had a large metal, metal belt buckle and the knife blade broke as it struck the belt buckle and he fled in terror. But I was more horrified that he recognized that I was trying to kill somebody over nothing. And I locked myself in the bathroom and I just started thinking about my life. And I realized that with a temper like that, I would never realize my dream of becoming a physician. I would end up in jail, reform school, or the grave. And none of those appealed to me. I just said, Lord, I can't control this. And I'll never become a physician with a temper like this unless you can control it. And it was a Bible, and I picked it up and opened it to the book of Proverbs, and there were all these verses in there about fools. It seemed like they were all written about me. But there were also verses about anger. Like Proverbs 19, 19, there's no point getting an angry man out of trouble, because he's just going to get right back into it. But encouraging verses like Proverbs 16, 32, mightier is the man who can control his temper and the man who could conquer the city. And I just kept reading verse after verse, chapter after chapter. It seemed like it was all written for me. I stayed in that bathroom for three hours, reading and contemplating and praying. And I came to an understanding during that time that to lash out at somebody, to kick down the door, to hit someone in the face was not a sign of strength. It was a sign of weakness. It meant that you could easily be controlled by others and by the environment. It is also a sign of selfishness. Because somebody was always doing something to me. It's always about me, my, and I. And if you can take yourself out of the center of the equation and let it be about someone else, you're very unlikely to get angry. And when I walked out of that bathroom with those lessons under my belt, the anger was gone. I never had another episode after that. And some people say, you just learn how to cover it up. But you know, when God fixes a problem, he doesn't just do a paint job, he fixes it. And that problem is gone. And it is such an advantage when people can't make you angry. Uh, particularly in a world of politics. Uh, There's nothing they can say, nothing they can do. And uh, sometimes I kind of look at them and I just think to myself, that was once a cute little baby. I wonder what happened. <laughs> it gives you an enormous amount of control. And, uh, you know, the, the Lord always prepares you what he wants you to do. You never have to worry about that. But when we look around us today, we see so much destructive behavior going on in our nation. I think the vast majority of people would agree that we're moving in the wrong direction as a nation. We see all this corruption around us and nothing being done about it. Things that are not partisan issues being changed into partisan issues, like IRS corruption. That affects every single person. And yet, we're so easily manipulated that people think that somehow this is a partisan thing. This is criminal activity. It is antithetical to the concept of freedom personal freedom. And yet, we have government officials who expect people to believe that that computer crashed and that all the data that would demonstrate whether they were innocent or guilty coincidentally just happened to disappear. And amazingly, the six other people who got the emails, theirs crashed too. It's just amazing. And the phone, well, 
we just needed to get some new phones. So we wiped all of us out after the investigation had started. Gosh, we forgot there was an investigation going on and that we had been told that we weren't supposed to do that. Sorry, it was just an accident. They didn't expect people to actually believe this stuff. That is the amazing thing. And fortunately, I think there are a few people in Congress who are actually starting to get enough courage now to really go after this kind of thing. But they have to recognize that this affects the integrity of our governmental system. If we don't deal with this kind of thing, it's the same thing that the Roman Empire did. You don't deal with the corruption. No one believes in the government. No one believes in the rule of law or authority. And it greatly accelerates the deterioration of that society. It's so important that we bring integrity back. Dependency, another one of the things that is destroying the work ethic that made this into the most powerful, dynamic economic engine the world had ever seen. Dependency completely undermines that kind of system. Debt. Look at what our debt has done. Since the last time I was here, it's gone up more than a trillion dollars. We're now approaching $18 trillion in national debt. Can you even comprehend what that number means? If you try to pay that back at a rate of $10 million a day, and that's even a hard number to get you right, about $10 million a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, it would take you 5,000 years. $10 million a day. Back to the time of the pyramids. Think about that. And the only reason we can sustain a debt like that is because the US dollar is the reserve currency of the world, which means we can print money. Now, what happens if we can't print money? And some of you have probably heard of, of BRICS, uh, which stands for Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. These countries have gotten together and they're trying to formulate a new monetary system that is backed by gold and by minerals. Our dollar is backed by our good name, which isn't so good anymore. So what happens if they succeed, which they may? And we're no longer able to print money with the level of debt that we have. Instantaneous third world nation. That's what happens. This is one of the reasons that it is so vitally important that we arm ourselves with knowledge about finances so that when politicians tell us lies about this, we understand it and we know that we must get together and we must get those people out of office and we must put in place people who actually understand and care about the well-being of this nation. You know, Vladimir Lenin said one of the ways to destroy America is with unsustainable debt. It destroyed Spain in the 17th century and France in the 18th century and ancient Rome and Great Britain, and it will destroy us too. And we've had all of those people to learn from. So we've got to be a little bit smarter about the way we do things. And then there's the lack of leadership in the world. I mean, this is the pinnacle nation of the world. We do have a responsibility for leadership. It means we have to have plans on how to do things. We don't just sit around and react to things as they happen. And what's going on in the Middle East right now with ISIS? I mean, this is incredibly 
dangerous. These people are our sworn enemies. They want to destroy us. We can't sit around and wait for them to do something and then react to it. We have, we've got to develop our capabilities militarily, offensive and defensive, covert activities. We have to utilize the financial markets. We have to use everything within our power to destroy them. You know, they're earning at least two million dollars a day on the black market with oil sales. We can stop that. There's a whole bunch of things that we can stop, but we have to be serious and recognize that these people actually want to destroy us and destroy our way of life. And the only way to fight that is to destroy them first. You can't negotiate with people who want to destroy you. I mean, what's your bargaining chip? You're going to say, uh, just cut off one of my arms, just cut off one leg. You know, that doesn't make any sense. So until we begin to, to act like a pinnacle nation, other people will begin to fill the void. You look and you see what Russia's doing right now as Putin's starting to gradually try to put the Soviet Union back together again. And then we'll have another Cold War. And if we were smart, we would be establishing strong relationships with all the former components of the Soviet Union. And we would be reinforcing our commitment to NATO. And we'd be getting them involved in NATO so that he cannot come back in without consequences and take them. We would also be utilizing our natural resources. We would become energy independent. We would be using the EPA to work with academia and industry and business to come up with the cleanest, most effective, environmentally friendly ways of utilizing the tremendous natural resources that God has blessed this country with. We have more than eight times more oil than Saudi Arabia. We need to develop that. We now know how to liquefy natural gas, which means we can export that to Europe, make them dependent on us rather than on Russia, which puts Putin back in his little box. You know, these are things that we can do. We're smart people. We have the capabilities. And in terms of, of bringing the war to ISIS, you know, I've been fortunate enough to get to know a lot of the military brass. These are some really smart guys. And a lot of the, the people in the CIA and other places are really smart people. And a lot of engineers who can innovate all kinds of weaponry and defense systems but we handcuff them, and we don't let them work. We make them fight with one hand behind their back. And I'll tell you something. If we get those people inspired and working and don't impede them, ISIS will have no chance. ISIS will be ice was. I mean, that's the way it should be. <laughs> and you know, that's what happens when you really exercise true leadership. And then the other thing is division. You've noticed that the progressives do everything they can to divide people, divide and conquer. This is called the United States of America. Why is this called the United States of America? Think about this. Take a trip down to Ellis Island in New York Harbor and go into that museum and look at the pictures of people who came here from every part of the world. Many with only the things that they could carry. Look at the determination in their eyes. People who work not eight hours a day, but 10, 12, 16 hours a day, not five days a week, but six or seven days a week. No such thing as a minimum wage, work not for themselves, but for their sons and daughters, and grandsons and granddaughters, that they might have an opportunity in this land. Hundreds of years earlier, other, other immigrants came here involuntarily in a bottom of slave ships, working even longer, even harder for less. But they too had a dream. 
that one day their great grandsons and great granddaughters might pursue freedom and prosperity in this land. And do you know of all the nations in the world, this one, the United States of America, was the only one big enough and great enough to let all those people from all those places realize their dreams. And what that means is that all of us are culturally relevant to all of us. And that's what I would call the United States of America. And we need to recognize that we're all in the same boat. And if part of the boat sinks, the rest of us going down too. We need to make sure that we stop allowing the agents of division to succeed, to create a war on women, race wars, income wars, age wars, religious wars. Those people who are doing that, they are our enemies. And we need to be able to identify them. And these are things that we have to discuss. And how do we win this war in this nation? And I am absolutely certain that we will do it. We have to remember the pre-revolutionary days. What did they do? What did those patriots do? They were so tired of King George III and his dictatorial statues. And they started getting together, town halls and in their barns and their living room, and they started talking about what kind of America did they want to have? What were they willing to fight for? What did they want to pass on to their children and their grandchildren? And they encouraged each other. And that's how a ragtag bunch of militiamen gained the courage and the fortitude to defeat the most powerful empire on the earth. That can be done again today. Everybody in here has a sphere of influence. We've got to start exercising it. In the last presidential election, 93 million people did not vote. That's more, a lot more, than either candidate got. We have to re-involve those individuals. 30 million evangelicals did not vote because they said, Romney's a Mormon. You know, now, what people have to start realizing is if your candidate didn't win in the primary, when you say, I don't like the other guy, I'm taking my marbles and going home, that's like voting for that opposition. It's the same thing. And it's much better to work with somebody who agrees with you 90% of the time than somebody who disagrees with you 100% of the time. We have got to be smart enough to deny, when I say we, I'm talking about people with common sense. I don't care what your party is. People with common sense who love America and the American way. You know, I really don't care that much about the party affiliation. In fact, I wish that there was no party affiliation on the ballot. I wish you had to actually know who it was that you were voting for. I think it would make a huge difference in our country. <laughs> Having said that, <laughs> if, if I do run, even though I'm an independent, I would run as a Republican. Only because, <laughs> only because I re remember what happened with Ross Perot. And that is, that is not a good thing by any stretch of the imagination. But also, and, and I want to end with, with this thought, because I believe that God has not turned his back on this country because there are many people who have not turned their back on God. And most of those people tend to be conservatives. The progressive movement is trying to push God out. In their last presidential campaign, they had written 
God out of every aspect of their platform. And this is really a tremendous battle that we're in right now. We are talking about a nation that is for, of, and by the people that believes in Judeo-Christian values versus a nation that is for, of, and by the government that believes in cradle to grave entitlements. This is a huge divide. It is my belief that the vast majority of people actually fall on the side of personal responsibility and a government that is for up and by the people. But the people with the loudest voice are on the other side. What we have to do is be willing to stand up for America, stand up for American values, just like those people who preceded us stood up for us. Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death. He wasn't willing to sell for being a captive. Nathan Hale, a teenage rebel, a spy, caught, ready to be executed by the British. He said, my only regret is that I have but one life to give for my nation. D-Day, all those American soldiers flooding the beaches of Normandy, being mowed down hundreds at a time, thousands at a time. Did they turn back? No. They stepped over the bodies of their dead comrades, and they overwhelmed the Axis forces, knowing in many cases that they would be killed. Why did they do it? They did it for you and for me so that we could live in a free nation. And now it is time for us to stand up and do it for those who will follow us. And we can do it with the strength, determination, and intellect that we have and by the grace of God. And I know that the president said that we are not a Judeo-Christian nation. But I have news for you. He doesn't get to make that decision. We get to make that decision. decided that we were not really worthy of our freedom. And they decided to take us back. And they were winning the war, marching up to Eastern Seaboard, taking city after city. Took Washington, D.C., burned down the White House. Next stop, Chesapeake Bay, Baltimore Harbor, Fort McHenry, one of the last bastions standing. General Armistead, who was in charge of that, it had a large American flag commission to fly in front of the fort. And when the British Armada sailed into the Chesapeake Bay, battleships as far as you could see, the British Admiral said, this area is under our control. Take down that flag. It offends me. <laughs> you have until dusk to take the flag down. Aboard that ship was a young amateur American poet 